Hey viewers, this afternoon you're going to hear about audio or sound. Today we're listening to microphones from wired to wireless on camera, lapel, and shotgun. I'll show you hardware and techniques along with some no-nonsense pragmatic advice for online and YouTube-style video production. Uh, this video was initiated when I asked you whether I should review this new wireless kit from Ceremonic, the UW Mic 9S Kit 2, which they subsequently sent and told me I could keep. Everything else you'll see is my own. Uh, this video is about using a single microphone for a single speaking performer. Although, full disclosure, I am married and also this channel is not sponsored. I was not paid to post this. No one reviewed the script nor the video before I posted it. So if you're in a hurry to see, well, sorry, hear the wireless kit, use the chapter links. I like this product enough to do this review. I don't review products I don't feel are suitable. Now, to hear the difference, I suggest you listen on headphones or good quality speakers in a quiet environment at a volume that approximates the normal level of speech. But first, let's take a way back machine trip to a TV Ontario audio post room back several careers into the previous millennium. In a few weeks, this construction site will be a post-production audio suite for TV Ontario. Hello, my name is Martin Heilbronn, and although most people think of you as our viewers, as an audio technician, I think of you as our listeners. As you may have gathered, I was an audio engineer back in the day. <laughs> Mostly I did post-production mixing, but I also worked in studio and on location. Uh, for on-camera presenters, hosts, and interviews, we used the Sony ECM-55 lapel mic. Just about everybody did in those days, and what you're listening to now is a smaller, updated version, the ECM-77. In this video, the mic you're hearing is indicated in the lower left, but honestly, you don't see Sony much these days. When you see a lapel mic on broadcast TV, it's usually the Shure MX-150. Wired broadcast mics use this connector, the XLR, or more correctly, the XLR3, the initials stand for External Line Return. It was created by the Canon Electric Company in Los Angeles. They made all kinds of connectors for electrical components. Now, those three pins provide a balanced and grounded mono connection, and it locks in. There's a pin to release it. So, this is not a connector found on most cameras, although there are a few manufacturers, Sony and Panasonic, that provide brand-specific XLR adapting accessories, and there are lots of other options, including Beach Tech, the Tascam DR70D, and this Rodecaster Pro, which I'm using to record in my studio. If that seems like a lot of bother and expense, let's ask what's good enough. Can I get acceptable audio from an inexpensive mic with a 3.5mm connector plugged into the camera? Well, yes, you can. And let's switch over to the second mic, the Audio-Technica ATR350. It's going directly into the camera's 3.5mm audio in port. The small 3.5mm connector comes in multiple versions. For mono, there's tip and sleeve. For stereo, tip ring and sleeve, usually called TRS. Not grounded, doesn't lock in. Now, for this comparison, I've turned off the low cut filter and the limiter on the mixer and the camera to provide an uncolored and unadulterated recording. My general practice is to leave those settings on. So, did you hear a difference? Well, unless you're listening through headphones or on studio quality monitors in a quiet listening environment, I think you'll be hard pressed to hear it. You likely won't detect the difference on your computer speakers, and definitely not on a phone or tablet. Generally, the small difference in quality is audible only with optimal placement in a quiet recording studio, and you'll probably only notice when you hear them side by side as we're doing today. Our sonic memory between events isn't really very accurate. So, in my mind, to my ears, it is good enough for what you and I do. 
it's not good enough for professional cinema quality production. Very little of the equipment I use is. I don't pretend to work at that level, because cinema creators know movies are seen in quiet rooms with spectacular sound systems, where every detail and nuance can be appreciated and is used to create the emotional impact intended by the director. So here's the thing. The ECM 77 is about five times more expensive. Let's be generous and say it's 10% better. And under typical recording conditions and online playback situations, you are going to be hard pressed to hear even that difference. And already, you and I are not average consumers or average listeners. By selecting this video, you've self identified as someone who is concerned about sound. Now, if an inexpensive external mic is good enough, is the internal mic in my camera usable? Uh, no, it is not. There's no point even demonstrating that. Any camera's internal mic is a low quality component, and you're going to place the camera where it needs to be for visuals, not where the mic should be for sound. As well, it's going to pick up every adjustment, every touch of your hand to the camera. Don't even think about it. A camera's internal mic is suitable for ambient location sound to be used in the background of a mix. For anything else, step up. Even a shotgun mic mounted on the camera, this is the Sennheiser MKE 400, doesn't improve that much. I would not use this to record my voice. Now, incidentally, these mics, Sony, Sennheiser, and Audio Technica, require power. They all use batteries. You have to remember to turn them off and to carry a reserve battery at all times. The Sony doesn't have a power switch. I remove the battery at the end of the day. Now, if you have two performers, you'll need two mics, and then you'll need some kind of mixer. The Tascam, which is kind of portable, has four XLR inputs. Cameras have only one mic import. Trying to record multiple performers with a single mic, even on a shotgun mic on a boom, will not provide good results, uh, unless you have a boom operator. And I should point out that my studio is not sound treated. No foam panels or blankets, both of which I feel are kind of extreme, unless your situation is extreme, like a big empty room with reflective surfaces. Even so, a small lapel mic placed close to the speaker's mouth won't pick up very much of that ambience. So let's digress for a minute to mic technique. A lapel mic should be about 20 centimeters, my hand span away. To keep the cable hidden, bring it up inside the shirt over the second button and then through the clip with a nice little loop. Or if you wear an undergarment with a strap, that's often a good location. When you're hiding a mic, a test recording is a good idea, just to make sure you're not picking up any clothes rustling. So in windy situations, or if you don't want to see the mic, just clip it on the inside. Now, while I did that, you were listening to a shotgun on a boom. Let me widen the shot slightly so you can see it. It's about 30 centimeters away. The Deity S2 was given to me to review. Again, we can debate the fine details, but it's not materially better or worse than similarly priced shotgun mics used under the same circumstances. Now, this shotgun also requires power. The Rode mixer provides the 48 volts needed. Hopefully, you do notice the difference in sound between the lapel mics and the shotgun, but that is part of their design. Lapel mics are tuned for a close human voice. It emphasizes the frequencies of the voice, while the shotgun's wider response reaches into higher frequencies. The distance also helps, providing a more spacious and open sound. I find that more natural. That's why I use it for the majority of my videos. Lapel mics are less sensitive to ambient sounds in your recording environment. 
with a shotgun's more spacious and open sound, you may now hear air movement from your heating or cooling system. I turn mine off before I start recording. And all of these mics are wired with a cable running from the mic to the camera or mixer recorder. However, running a cable isn't always practical. And that's why a wireless mic kit like the one Sarah Monic sent for review is useful. The mic connects to a transmitter, which I clip to something at the small of my back, and sends the radio frequency audio signal to the receiver, which mounts on the camera and connects to the camera's 3.5 millimeter mic input. Now, this version of the kit arrived in a sturdy carry and storage case. That's always appreciated. Ceremonic says it's watertight. I didn't test that. The kit includes two transmitters and one receiver. They are black and handsome, if somewhat rectangular and utilitarian. The transmitter weighs 157 grams, the receiver 193. Now its largest dimension height is about 8 centimeters at 13 centimeters for the antenna. That's comparable to the competition, where the weight doesn't usually include the battery. Now the kit includes a whole lot of cables and accessories. These clips attach to the transmitters and receivers to make them easier to wear. There's a cold shoe mounting plate for the receiver for camera mounting. There's a mic for each transmitter, each with a pop screen and what we used to call a tie clip. Using a screwdriver, you can rotate the clip vertically if needed for performers wearing t-shirts and such. Three USB-C to USB-A cables to charge the units. Two 3.5 mm to XLR output cables for connection to a mixer. One micro to micro output cable to connect to the camera. And one dual micro to micro cable. The mics and the output cable use a screw-on type 3.5 mm connector at the receiver or transmitter end. Now finally, mic accessory packs. Uh, four standard wind filters and four more of the heavy-duty ones called wombats. And two replacement clips. Very generous. So, let me know what you think about the sound compared to Sony. The stated frequency response is 40 Hz to 18 kHz, only slightly less than the Sony's 40 to 20. To my ear, quality is nearly identical, but the response curve is slightly different. I have a small preference for the sound of the Ceremonic, which adds a touch more color in the lower frequencies. Now, the receiver's antennae can be oriented or removed, handy in case you need to replace them. And there are independent outputs for each channel. The receiver has a mic line input jack and a headphone out. That's not usual. That third input can be used for an on-camera ambience mic. The USB-C connector charges the unit's internal battery and can also power the unit while it's operating. It's a little sensitive and didn't work with all my USB-C chargers. And I like the rechargeable battery. All of my previous wireless kits have been prolific battery consumers, so no more loads of batteries going to landfill. And the charge lasts a long time. Ceramonic says eight hours, and that's a claim I did verify. That's three loads of double A's in the competition. And while a lunch hour top-up is possible, a full charge takes three to four hours. Press the power key to turn it on. The bright OLED display lights up. Lots of good detail displayed here, but the display design style is a little bit 8-bit chunky. The transmitters also have adjustable and removable antennae. There are mic and line inputs. USB-C power port on the bottom. After the transmitter's turned on, the receiver's blue light confirms it's receiving a radio frequency signal and we're ready to go. The bar graph shows audio levels. A quick press of the power button on the transmitter mutes the mic. The audio indicator flashes red. It's slightly awkward as it's a quick press so easy to inadvertently power down. And the receiver also has an on-off switch for each transmitter 
they don't power down the transmitter, just mute the input on the receiver. The receiver screen displays signal strength from each transmitter and battery level. Audio level for each channel displays at the bottom. The transmitter shows the RF power setting. H is high, a menu adjustment. The power mute button is displayed as unlocked. The plus navigates the menu selections. Press set to change an option, plus again to select the option. The mute key can be disabled, as can the power key. Now, there's only one audio control, the mic sensitivity, set from 0 to 8. Listen on the receiver to determine the best setting. And the receiver also has a power key lock option. The receiver has controls for the input port to disable, select mic or line, set the gain with a range of 0 to 15, and add a low cut filter to reduce low frequency rumble. Both units paired automatically as delivered. An auto scan determines the optimal channel for each transmitter. Then, to match the transmitter to the new channel, set both receiver and transmitter to match, then face them together. <laughs> Couldn't be easier. The receiver can output mono or stereo. In mono, both mics go to both outputs. In stereo, they're independent. The stereo separation is excellent. However, the receiver's local input goes to both channels. Now, on the receiver, each channel has volume controls to balance the two for the mono mix. There's no level for the headphone output. And headphones are the one accessory that's not included in this kit. I prefer to output and record channels independently in the mixer to balance while editing. Yes. That requires synchronizing in post. But if you haven't done it, it's easier than you think. Well, there are a few more technical settings, like frequency. Now, I've recorded interviews on movie sets where I was assigned an RF frequency. Uh, the usual placement of this smaller than lapel sized mic would be on a shirt. It's also small enough to tape to the inside of my glasses. <laughs> That's what you're listening to now. At that point, it's kind of like a shotgun mic, and you'll hear that the sound is a little more open than the traditional chest placement, but that does require a quieter environment. I've seen lots of even more innovative placement. For example, in the theater, you often see it at the hairline or mounted over the ear, with omnidirectional mics, a variety of placements provide good sound. But do test first. And audio techs know that surgical tape is handy for placement and concealment situations. With the mic in my glasses, the cable is taped to the back of my neck before heading down my shirt to the transmitter. Ah, because they are subject to more wear and tear, the mics used in wireless kits typically don't last very long. It's usually the cable or the connector. Uh, sometimes it's fixable, if you're handy with wire cutters and electrical tape. However, it is always good practice to have a backup mic. And you'll find mics with compatible locking connectors from many of the microphone manufacturers. The cable between the camera and the receiver is less likely to suffer the same wear and tear. All the same, a spare might be a lifesaver. Now, if you'd like to use a standard mic, possibly a handheld like this sportscaster's favorite, the Shure VP64 with the Ceramonic kit, you can purchase adapters from XLR to the 3.5mm locking connector. Uh, that works on the transmitter's line-in connection. And Kim helped me test reception distance while we were out hiking. The actual range may be more, but the reliable range is under 15 meters. And I've not compared the Ceramonic with another wireless kit side by side, but this is the equal and in a few ways better than the prosumer competition. The components are sturdy and well-made, 
With good attention to detail, nothing in this kit feels flimsy or cheap. That said, it is a little soon to comment on reliability. Now, performance is very good. I spent a whole day wearing it and experienced a few random RF hits, and that is not unusual in any price category. However, during a day of shooting the segments for this video in my studio, there were no interruptions of any kind. Still, it's always wise to check your recordings before you strike a scene. I have one operational suggestion. I'd like to be able to identify the power button a little more easily as I reach behind. As a package, this Ceramonic kit is a bargain, with good innovation and nice detail. But there's one feature I'd love to see on a wireless kit, and that's internal recording. Maybe internal memory, maybe micro SD. Eight hours, same as battery life, would be enough. That would provide the ultimate fail-safe backup when the inevitable dropout occurs. Now, I said that I record externally on a mixer recorder. It's less convenient, but it's better quality. Now, on most recorders, you can set the file format, sampling frequency, and bit depth. Is my camera, or your camera, capable of recording high-quality sound? Maybe but certainly not as high as a separate recorder. And I get each channel recorded independently for later remixing if needed. Uh, with cost and size limitations, camera circuits and components can't possibly compare with dedicated audio equipment. If audio is important to you, record externally, sync in editing. Well, last topic, recording levels. When you are recording audio, the levels should not be red and only occasionally yellow. Sound that is distorted because it's too loud cannot be fixed. However, if the recording is quiet, turning up the volume while editing is simple. And with the low noise levels, the ceremonic system is rated at 75 dB, you have the latitude to turn it up quite a bit before noise becomes even close to audible. The obvious distortion is peak distortion, overloading the circuit beyond its capacity to register detail, and that's obvious. I'm not going to demonstrate. Now, less obvious is the use of a limiter in the circuit. This clever electronic component limits the loudest sounds to a non-distorted recordable level. Most cameras have built-in limiters. Uh, sometimes they can be disabled. Now, they're dangerous only if your levels are high. And then everything seems artificially loud and there's a lack of dynamic range. Even quiet sounds are loud. Uh, most of us can hear the limiter clamp down and then release when the loud part is over. Although there are good limiters, they are rarely found in cameras. If your sound requires it, apply the limiter or compressor effects in post, where you have more control over them. And until you get to your audio post-production stage, keep audio levels under the maximum. So, if you are interested in this product, Ceramonic has provided a link to a retailer. They sell a one transmitter and this two transmitter version. That's in the description. I will not get a commission from that purchase. I have included affiliate links to some of the other products I've mentioned where I will get a small commission to support my work. However, I would encourage you to support your local camera or photo video store. They are a useful resource in your community. And music stores are also good sources to check out for mics, mixers, and other audio paraphernalia. So, for those inclined to subscribe, please click the button below. As I said at the beginning, I am not sponsored, so I don't stop in the middle to promote some product or service nor do I allow YouTube to interrupt my videos with mid-roll ads. Those decisions make this a better channel for you, but they do have a financial impact, so I am very grateful to those of you who have decided to support this channel by becoming a member. Uh, membership perks include a private email address where members are whitelisted 
so you can correspond directly with me. Use the Join button below. But subscribers need not worry. No content will be behind a paywall. And I do read and reply to all relevant and civil comments and questions. Thanks for watching. Stay safe.